Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tanisha Shields, and I am a Senior Land Services Officer with Western Local Land Services. Today, we will be hearing from John Francis about profitability in goat enterprises. Before we get started on today's webinar, I'll just take you through some housekeeping. You should see the following control panel on your screen. If you don't see the control panel, please click the orange arrow to display the control panel. Here is where you choose your audio option as well as ask questions. You are in listen only mode, which means you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Please note today's presentation will be recorded and you will be sent a link to the recording within the next 24 hours. We will be answering some of the questions you have already sent through today in your registration form. Throughout the webinar, if you have any more questions, you can ask questions by typing them into the questions box. John will then answer your questions. I will just start tonight's webinar with a few quick polls. This will help me to gauge who is joining us today and to check that the program is working correctly. I'll just launch the first poll now to everybody. Once that poll is distributed, if you're having trouble answering the questions, you might just have to exit full screen mode in order to be able to answer those poll questions. Very good, we've got some poll results coming through. I've got about 60% of votes, so I'll give you a few more seconds. 70% of votes. Remember that if you're having issues answering the poll question, just exit the full screen mode. Okay, I'll close that poll in five, four, three, two, one. I will now share those poll results with you. So the results of the poll, what is your industry role? With us tonight, we have 47% mixed species producers, 27% goat producers, and the remaining are a mixture of sheep, cattle, and advisors. I will quickly jump into the next poll. So the second poll question is, in the last three years, approximately what proportion of total farm income did goat sales contribute to? So there's a range from zero to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, and 80 to 100%. I've got 50% of votes, so I'll just wait a little bit longer for the last few people to put their votes in. Starting to get a few more responses in, so I'll just give you a couple more seconds and I'll close that poll down in five, four, three, two, one. Close that. The results of that poll, so we've got 47% with goats contributing zero to 20% of their total farm income, 24% with 20 to 40%, 12% for 40 to 80% and 6% for 80 to 100%. Okay, everyone, the last poll question before we hand over to John. So the final poll question should be displayed on your screen now. So in terms of the goat enterprise on your farm, do you see it increasing as a proportion of total contribution to income? So that's whole farm income or decreasing or no change? Got 61% of votes. So those that haven't answered the question, I'll give you a few more seconds to get your responses in. And I'll close that poll down in five, four, three, two, one. I'll just quickly share that last poll result with you. So we've got 88% of people in the audience intend to increase 
their goat enterprise on their farm. So that's great leading into what we're going to cover this afternoon. Okay, I'll now hand over to John. John Francis is a consultant with Agrista based in Wagga Wagga. John has expertise in farm business management and farm financial management. John has been working with MLA on a goat project looking at the production and financial performance of goat enterprises at the farm level. John will be delivering this evening the findings of the MLA project, which is soon to be submitted. I'll just change that over to you now, John, and make you the presenter. Thank you. I'll just work out which one of these screens it is, and I think it's that one. And I'll check that we're right. Yep, we're all go. All right, so thanks very much, Tanisha. That's great, and I really appreciate uh, being invited to contribute um, the findings to date. Um, so tonight what I'd like to do is just uh, give you a bit of background on um, the project. I'd like to thank you for some phenomenal questions um, prior to me starting, I've, um, and pretty well, I think about 90% of those I won't be able to answer, but I'm going to try um, to answer most of them. But the caveat is a lot of my responses actually didn't come out of the project. They're more from my experiences and engagements with um, with some of the producers that I've had involved in the in the program. So, um, so the 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 things I took away from the questions that you've asked, which I'll try and answer at the end of this presentation, um, a lot of them are practical components and a lot of them are requests for data as much as anything. And so I really applaud you for asking those questions. Um, the downside for you is uh, that I can't answer them with confidence. I can answer some of them with utmost com confidence. Um, but a lot of them I actually can't answer with a lot of confidence, which just goes to show that um, we actually don't have the data for a lot of those um, questions. But we'll we'll cover what I can answer um, a bit later on. So once I talk, give you some background, I'll also then just um, feed into how I see GOATS um, uh, performing against some of the other enterprises. And I actually wasn't, I asked two of those questions this evening just to get a feel for where um, where you think the goat uh, industry is going, and I wasn't surprised by your response to um, to the third question, which was a lot of you saw your income increasing. Now, what I didn't ask was whether you saw that increasing as a result of price or numbers or a contribution of both. I suspect it's um, probably more numbers than price, but um, I'll, I'll touch on um, I'll touch on why I think goats are a great enterprise, particularly in the rangelands, and um, I'll touch on why um, what you can do to be as good as you can um, in goat production. So I think the best way for me to start is just to get into it. And as Tanisha said, if if you've got questions. Um, I don't think I've got the questions, but I've got a bit of a chat box here. Um, so I'll let Tanisha field your questions. I'm flat out breathing and talking at the same time. So I probably, I will come back to the chat every now and again, but if you've got something that you want to interject with, feel free to use that chat box and just, um, and use that if that's okay with you, Tanisha, to engage as well. So questions in the question box, but if you want to, um, interject and um, and contribute, then I'm more than happy. And if you've got experiences on some of these later questions, my hope is that you can contribute those experiences to get um, a better outcome. And, and so all disclosure up front, um, I am not by any stretch an expert in um, the operational components of GOAT enterprises. Um, I've just been in the luxurious position of collecting some of the production and financial data. And I guess my role has really been more analytical and to try and drag out where I see some of the key messages coming out of that information. And in terms of my um, capacity and ability to do that, I guess I've got a background in 
um, in production. I, I was an agronomist at one stage and I moved out of that agronomy space into um, farm business management. And a lot of what I've done is looked at farm performance assessment, which is effectively um, what this project is all about. Okay, so let's start by quantifying um, what we actually mean by um, livestock and business performance. And what is it that we're actually looking at when we're talking about um, performance indicators? And, and I like to think of, um, of production and business performance indicators like the dashboard of your motor car. Each dial is an indicator of a different aspect of your car performance. So in this case, I think this is my old vehicle. Um, it, if we've got a, a taco on the left-hand side, we've got a, a temperature gauge, we've got um, in the middle, it's telling me how much fuel I've got. On the right-hand side, it's telling me um, how much fuel, what the temperature is outside and what my speedo is and then the whole odometer. So each one of those dials is telling me something different about the performance of the vehicle. Now, some of those indicators are linked um, to each other and some of those are actually standalone indicators in their own right. So for example, the speedo is a gauge of a speed, is a, a, a speed at a point in time, but that information actually feeds into the trip computer, which gives average speed over the trip and accumulated distance and all that sort of stuff. The, the dashboard gauges are there to monitor car and driver performance and efficiency. And some of those gauges are actually designed to provide you a warning so that you can change something before you do any damage. What the car, what those gauges don't do is actually change your car performance. They just indicate how you're traveling. So for car performance to actually improve, the driver's actually got to take that information, which is delivered by the instruments on the screen and make a decision about what to change and how to implement that change. So in farm business performance, it's exactly the same. What I've done is in this project, we've collected a whole lot of information about the farm business. And each one of those is a gauge of some part of the business, which might be a production measure, kilos of, of goat meat produced or stocking rate in DSEs per hectare, or it could be um, you know, income in dollars per DSE or dollars per goat sold. All those are indicators and they don't change your performance. But what we do is take that information and hopefully with a bit of interpretation, you can take that information and use it to change performance to actually manage what you do better. And that's what this project is all about. And the reason it's come about is that there really wasn't a lot of information out there on the performance of GOAT enterprises um, in their own right. And there wasn't a lot of uh, data on the performance of GOAT enterprises relative to other enterprises. So the second part of that is benchmarking. So the first part was we collected a whole lot of information, which is really just about farm performance. And the first part was financial performance. And the second part was production performance. And there's a whole lot of productivity indicators that I'll allude to later on. But the second part of that is the interpretation of that information such that you can use it um, to, for good, which is really about changing something in your business to improve what you do, which might be a change in production so that you increase income to get a better outcome. It could be about you changing cost structure to lower your costs from the same income to get a better profitability outcome. Or it could be one of the productivity measures that allows you to improve um, either income or cost per unit of production. So I've just used this analogy um, to give you an idea of what benchmarking is. And in this case, um, I've just got the, um, the uh, Richmond team and the Geelong team AFL sides. 
and I've got Dusty Martin against um, Dangerfield. And I know, I know they didn't play um, necessarily head to head this year. This was last year's. Um, but what you've got here is just um, a few figures about uh, Dusty Martin and a few figures about Patrick Dangerfield up the top. There's a rating, what position they are, when they were born, all that sort of stuff. But down below is a bit of information, and this comes from the AFL website, about contested possessions, uncontested possessions, intercepts, turnovers, all that sort of stuff. And then over the right-hand side is their scoreboard impact um, goals and inside 50s and goal assists and all those sorts of things. This is actually benchmarking data. All they've done is taken the, the information about performance of Dusty and they're comparing the information of Dusty with Dangerfield on the right-hand side. And th if you think about that, I'll guarantee you that Dusty and Dangerfield before most games have already looked at this information. They've looked at where the weaknesses are in their components and they've looked at how they're going to capitalise on those weaknesses to improve what they do. And it's exactly the same in farm benchmarking or this, in this case goat enterprise benchmarking. All it is is a comparison to identify the differences in performance. So what we've done I haven't taken one producer against another producer. What I've tried to do is take out the top producers from all those producers that we looked at. And to be the top, you had to be one of the most profitable or generate the most profit per DSE. And there's about four of those and I grouped them up and then I compared them with the rest of the producers from the rangelands. And the idea of that was to try and tease out what it was about these four producers that made their businesses generate more profit relative to the remainder. And that's sort of where I'm going to head to um, with some of the discussion this evening. So just as you can benchmark um, AFL players, you know, you can benchmark, I don't know, um, nearly any sport you like and you can benchmark anything Benchmarking just really stands for a comparison. So in this case, I'm comparing high profit producers with the remainder to try and tease out where you might get um, some benefits. And unashamedly, I'm just looking at their systems and trying to take the best bits from those systems. Why? Because that's what we do. I mean, that that is one way of learning um, where the opportunities are within your business. Okay, so the project um, looked at all goat production systems, but the majority of the data that we collected was actually from the rangelands or um, low rainfall areas. And so each one of those um, spots re represents um, a rough location of where the data was. There's one WA producer, but the rest were from um, New South Wales with the majority of data points being in Queensland and most of those were in the rangelands. Now in terms of the length and longevity of those producers and how long they've been in the system, um, it actually varied quite a lot. Some of those were new entrants to the industry, some of them had been in there for quite a number of years and some may have three or so years of data. In terms of their production systems, um, each one of these producers had a focus on meat production. Um, I've grouped them into rangelands and I guess um, there were two sort of outcomes here. There were managed goats, which effectively were um, fenced in most cases, or unfenced um, goats, which were effectively opportunistically harvested goats is what I've called those. So anytime I'm talking about um, opportunistically harvested, I'm really talking about a wild harvest there. Um, there were a few traders in the group and so typically those people would buy from depots um, and hold and then put weight on goats and then turn them off. Um, I haven't separated them. There wasn't enough data to separate them. And generally they were running alongside a breeding operation in most cases. So how many goats did we um, benchmark? Look, there were roughly um, well over half a million for the five year period, which is you know um, 
uh, a bit over 100,000 a year in the in the rangelands data set um, was what we did. The way I looked at these um, these enterprises, because I knew I'd want to compare them with other livestock enterprises, I actually wanted to convert um, the number of goats managed into the number of DSE managed. And the way I did that was to use um, some conventional um, ratings per head for uh, for goats managed. But of course, as you would well know, that not every, um, you don't necessarily know, particularly if you've got a um, opportunistically harvested herd, how many goats you run annually. So I made the assumption that uh, producers with opportunistically harvested herds, the number of goats sold represented 50% of the goat, number of goats managed. And the only reason I would change that is if a producer actually said, no, I think there's a lot more. So that's an assumption I had to make um, to understand the number of DSEs that you were running. And the reason I needed to know the number of DSEs that you were running was really largely an issue of the cost components in the business. So basically what I did was allocated your overhead cost um, structure or the people who were involved in this study. Um, I prorated, which just means I allocated the overhead cost, except for labour, on the basis of the number of goat DSEs relative to sheep DSEs or beef DSEs. So that's the way I came up with um, a way of allocating costs between um, enterprises. That's a fairly commonly used methodology. Um, so you can see the DSE ratings here. Um, the average for a doe um, or a nanny through the year um, as a twin is roughly 1.2 and as a single is about one. A weaner's 0.75 and a billy um, greater than 12 months is 1.5. So if you look at that across the herd, typically um, I've used a rough rule of thumb that, that one goat equals one DSE. It's roughly right, it's not precisely right. Okay, so what was the information that we sort of collected or what were the outputs? Um, here's, I've just put this up so that you've got a concept of the type of information that we actually collected. Um, in this case, I, I've got your farm. There's two tables. Well, there's one table on the left-hand side of this slide, and then there's a, a indicator graph on the right-hand side of this. And I'll just talk you through the table of data on the left to start with. So in this table of data, these, this is an output of uh, the farm performance assessment or the farm benchmarking. And what you see in the first column is the outputs for, in this case, the farm that was being examined. And then it was compared with the outputs of the average, which is in the next column, and the top 20% of producers. And those top 20% of producers were ranked on profits per DSE, which aren't shown in this slide. So we looked at their average annual stocking rate, we looked at their average annual stocking rate per hectare per 100 mils. We looked at their cost of production. Um, we looked at their price received. Um, we looked at their price received dollars per head sold, production in kilos per DSE. Um, and then we looked at things like labour efficiency, which I'll talk through shortly. Um, so that's measured in DSEs per labour unit. So a labour unit in our language is about 240 days of the year. Then we looked at kidding percentage and clearly if you're in a wild harvested situation or even many managed, there's not a lot of data around kidding percentage. So I think I dropped that out of the, um, out of the assessments. Um, a bit about deaths, um, labour units per enterprise. And then, then I collected things like land value in dollars per DSA managed. And this would be from the first year because land values have increased and I'll talk to that as well. I looked at return on assets managed, um, and you can see 20.8% over on the right hand side. That might be when I didn't have much data in, and that was you know, a few very good producers. 
and it would be on the early end of the data capture. Um, but return on assets managed is a measure of whole farm profitability. It's a measure of your profit relative to the total value of assets under management. So it's a really important gauge of how you're performing. It's called operating, um, operating return and it's probably the number one um, indicator that you need to look at at your whole farm business. But over the course of this, um, me presenting the data, I'll show just how good goats have been and they have been excellent. And there's two reasons for that. Um, one is that in the rangelands, typically you have a lower value of land per DSE because you are more remote. And the second one is that you have um, some you have had over the last five years some very good profits out of goat enterprises. Um, the next indicator there is net profit as a percent of gross profit. And so basically that's a really good indicator if you want one. Um, what that's saying is basically for all the income that you produce, how much was retained as profit? And in this case, this business, um, for every dollar worth of income, they've kept 68 cents as profit. And you can see the average kept 15 cents. So there's some um, work to make up for there. And then um, we've just got uh, the final one, which is gross profit per labour unit. That again is a bit of an indicator about how much income you're ge generating from every 240 day labour unit on the farm. And you can see out on the right hand side, that's exceptional. As the data came in, um, a lot of these figures were watered down. On the right hand side, all I've got is those, those same numbers presented graphically. So in this case, what the top one is indicating is that they, this producer had average labour efficiency at about um, 7,400 DSEs per labour unit. Um, they had below average gross profit per labour unit. Um, they had um, very good net profit as a percent of gross profit. They were in the top 20% for that indicator. Um, their return on assets was average, but average there is 5%, so that's nothing to sneeze at. And then that scale I've just put from, basically from most improvement likely down the red end to least improvement likely. So. As you move from left to right, you're getting up towards, it's harder to get better than, um, than where you are up the top end. So that's all that's showing. So they were sort of the outputs and the way they were presented. So let's get into um, the meat, which is um, how did goats perform? And that's what uh, this slide demonstrates. So what I've presented here is uh, the net profit in dollars per DSE of rangelands goats, which is the rightmost um, green column. And then I've compared that with a range of other enterprises. Now, you've got to be a bit cautious when you look at this information in its rawest form, um, which it is here, in so much as um, you've got to keep in mind that all the data regarding wool, beef, lamb and dual purpose sheep didn't come from rangelands businesses. And what happened in the rangelands over this five year period from 2016 to 2020 was actually that three of those, um, three of the five years that we captured basically had rainfall that was around 62 to 68% of the long-term average indicating pretty well drought for three years. Um, so you've got to put that in the context. In those those enterprises on the left of this graph might have had drought for one or maybe two years. The one on the right hand side has had drought for three years. So contextualising that, um, and the other part of this is don't forget this was when wool was outstanding. So their financial years, and I think that's the best run of financial years that we would have had for wool businesses out of the last 15 years. So um, price-wise, wool was as good as it gets. Um, a dual purpose sheep, just for your information, is basically uh, typically a merino joined to a terminal sire. So it hangs off most wool enterprises because a lot of those wool enterprises are in um, sort of high rainfall areas and they'll join their um, usually they're cull animals to a terminal 
and try and value add that way. And you can see the dual purpose system is a very good system and a highly profitable system. But the interesting thing I think for me about this, um, about this graph is rangelands goat, even though you've had three years of pretty poor conditions, has held its own and actually it's probably um, been superior when you look at, um, well, it has been, it's generated superior profits relative to beef and lamb. Now, the other caveat with using this information in its absolute form is that those enterprises on the left uh, used a slightly different value of labour, um, family labour, relative to um, the, the data set on the right, which is the one um, I've collected for the MLA project. So the data regarding wool, beef, lamb and dual purpose sheep came from the old home sacket data set. And um, that data set charged labour out at $115,000 per first family labour unit. Whereas in this rangelands goat um, uh, performance assessment, I've char charged family labour out at $70,000. Now that doesn't mean I'll think you're worth less, it just reflected better with the AVAIRS sort of methodology rather than um, the home second methodology. But really what that means is that um, Rangelands goat profits might be um, a little bit higher uh, as a function of me having lower labour costs in there. So you've just got to be aware of that when you're using that comparison. So overall, um, the meat of this presentation, how has Rangelands Goats performed um, very well? And I think that's reflected in your response to the third question tonight, where most of you said you expect um, an increase in, uh, in goat revenue relative to um, in, in the next little while. Okay, um, so, I've just pulled that out, that um, last figure, which was an average of five years, and I've turned it into, um, I've, I've looked at it over the five year period, and this is actually how it looked. So this is Rangelands Profit or EBIT, and EBIT just stands for Earnings Before Interest and Tax. Um, it's measured in dollars per DSE, which is along the left-hand axis. And along the bottom axis is the years. Now, the thing I want you to think about with this, um, with this graph is the fact that 2018, 19 and 20 were all about 62 to 68% of long-term rainfall. So um, it's not surprising that we see, in fact, the worst of it was 2019. And I think that's a carryover of the fact that we probably mined some of the resource in 2018 and the effects of that weren't actually felt till 2019. So I'm not surprised by that. But this 2020 um, result, which is $38 per DSE, which is just phenomenal, is a function of um, largely price. The average price across that year was greater than $10 per kilo carcass weight. Um, and none of these prices uh, were anywhere near that. So, um, so what you see there is the extent of the volatility. In a bad year, we were down to $6 per DSE. And in a um, good year, we were up to $38 per DSE. But the thing about that, which I think is really encouraging, is if you think about as bad as those droughts get, um, we're still making money out of goats when things are pretty dire. Now that's not to say every individual data point in this data set um, made money. There were plenty that made losses over those years. However, it's not a bad outcome given, um, given the extent and severity of the drought. Now I would have loved to have more data from your part of the world, but we did um, have some challenges in terms of getting people engaged in this pro, pro, um, project. And so that's why that there's not the same depth of data um, that I would have liked. Okay. So we had more volatility um, in 
than some of the other enterprises and that's assessed in, in this slide here. So along this slide, what I've taken is the margin, which is measured in dollars per kilogram of carcass weight um, sold in this case. So along the left-hand axis here, we've got the, um, the margin and that's the bit you keep for every kilogram sold, um, which is minus $2 up to $4 um, per kilo carcass weight. So that's the bit between um, your costs, cost of production and the price received. So that's the bit you get to pocket. So for every kilo you produced um, in the rangelands, just to define this, goat is the green colour, beef's um, the orangey colour and lamb is the greyish colour. So if we take 2016 year, um, for every kilo produced, there was $2 retained. And then if we take the really good year out to 2020, for every kilo produced on average, there was $3.50 retained um, as margin by producers. And you can see that um, when, when we got to this bad year, um, there was a, a return of minus $1 and that may seem strange given that we had a $6 um, profit in the preceding graph, but there's a bit of weighted average components to this, which is why that's sitting at um, minus $1. So big variation in um, goats, but not unexpected given the seasonal conditions. But the really important take home for me from this is have a look where some of those other enterprises are. So sure, beef has been more static, um, or sorry, lamb has been more static. There's not a lot of variation, but there's also not the upside that you see in goat. And part of that is about the way lamb producers have sort of incurred their price increases over time. They've actually, as price has gone up, the margins haven't changed much. So if you think of price seems to go up every year with lamb, but what goes up with it is the cost to produce those lambs. And so you haven't seen a, a massive change in the margins being retained in lamb businesses. Now beef, in this case, we've had some pretty good years there and then it's gone down. Well, the reason it's gone down is largely a function of those two years, even in that beef data set were um, pretty poor years seasonally. So there's, um, there's a bit of drought effects in that beef. But what this tells me is there's probably more resilience, assuming the prices are um, maintained somewhere above that $7 per kilo carcass weight, there's, there may be more resilience in a goat production system um, than a beef system. And I might be telling you something that you already know there, the other thing is I think you've got a competitive advantage against lamb um, because you're retaining more of the margin on average um, in, in um, goat production enterprises relative to lamb and beef. So down the bottom, the five year average of margins retained was $1.75 for goats, um, for lamb it was $1.30 and for beef, which I've brought back to carcass weight just for comparison, was $1.42 um, per kilo. Okay, um, so goat enterprises have a, um, have a lower cost of production than lamb. So this graph just shows cost of production on the left-hand axis running from um, zero to $6. Um, but one of the, I guess, um, one of the things to think about here is if you think about how exposed we might be market-wise from some of those other enterprises, what you've got to be sure about is that, that your cost of production is below and is far enough below where you think the future price will be so that you're retaining an adequate margin to carry on and invest in the future things you need to for your business. So. If, if you think that $5 is okay because you think prices are going to be at $10, well, that's fine, but we'll look at some data um, later on that suggests that $10 may not be where it'll be in the future, and that means your margin's getting skinnier. So my preference is always in commodity type industries, as GOAT is, um, my preference is usually to um, 
fight that price issue, which is out of your hands, with managing a low cost of production. And I'll talk to um, some of the better producers and how they achieve that. Um, you have a look at lamb and lamb uh, on average over that five year period sat at $5.50. Now the issue was that with that was, as you saw earlier this year, lamb prices came back to around $6.50 or thereabouts. And so they're keeping a very small margin for themselves when that price comes back. And you've got to, start looking at yourselves and, and looking at your business and say, well, is there something I can do about that to change my cost of production? And beef, um, again, this is carcass weight. They're looking at $4 per kilo carcass weight, which is about $2 per kilo um, live weight um, at the time that this um, data was collected. Okay, excuse my sniffling there. All right, so um, the next slide really is titled, you have to become more productive to stay profitable. And this is just a little bit of data that I thought would interest you. Um, uh, this is, uh, uh, I've actually got the wrong axis on that. That is, um, I apologize for that. This is land price. Um, in dollars per DSE, so forget about that. Um, forget about that return on our assets. This is land price in dollars per DSE, and what you see is there's two data sets there. There's the home sacket data set, um, and you see, uh, and then there's the rangelands goat data set. That's the data set that I um, collected in this MLA project. And the interesting thing I think about this is there's about you know, roughly a hundred bucks or a bit more at the moment, um, hundred dollars per DSE difference between some of this home sacket data, and that's largely because it's in high rainfall area, um, home sacket land prices or land price per DSE relative to um, rangelands goats. Now I've taken a few outliers out to get this um, trend, but the trend for both is a pretty big increase. So you've gone from 300 bucks or 320 a DSE up to well over 500 bucks a DSE. And remember this is at the start of the financial year. It might've kept going since then. Um, and in the home sacket data set, you've gone from 400 to sort of $750 per DSE, which is a pretty massive increase as well. So we're seeing this rapid rise in capital growth of land. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because as your land asset value increases, it means your profits have to increase by the same proportion to stay as profitable as you did in the past. Because remember, return on assets is a measure of profit divided by the total asset value under management and land accounts for most of your asset value under management. So um, what you've got here is, um, a trend towards increasing land prices, um, which will always happen. It mightn't be as distinct as that. This has been a very rapid growth period here. But the other interesting thing is, you know, you have actually matched it with operating profits of the business. Okay, so this is um, return on assets managed. Um, and what I'm assessing here is the rangeland goat performance against all of the home sacket data. Um, and I've just pulled it together um, from 2016 to 2020. And what you've got is an average return on assets from rangelands goats of over 5%. I think it should read 5.4, not 5.8. I've got a few additional data points versus 3.6. That's just exceptional. So even though profits, weren't necessarily higher than some of those other enterprises. Profitability is, why? Because of that preceding graph, which shows that there's a bit of land price difference between the rangelands and the high rainfall area. Why is that? Well, the more remote nature of it, harder to get labor, um, additional costs of freight and those sorts of things are part of why there tends to be a bit of a difference in the rangelands relative to elsewhere and greater volatility. Um, but don't worry, I won't tell anyone how good it is to be in the rangelands and you guys can keep um, getting bigger and better at what you do. 
Okay, um, so that's a bit of background. I know I'm well into the presentation now, but I'm going to go into now um, what the best did or how much better they were and why. And so I've done this by presenting this information here. So the best is the green colour in this, um, and that's, I've just taken out the four highest profit producers, and I'll talk a little bit about how there's actually, it's nearly, there's nearly two pathways to high profit, um, but I'll, I'll talk to this first, and then the rest I've just grouped up into the rest. So $60 per DSE, doesn't look like much, um, or 61 or whatever it is there, and about 55 or thereabouts um, per DSE from the rest rangeland. So they generate gross profit is just, it, it's sales, less purchases, pardon me, plus the value of inventory change. So that's how we calculate gross profit. And what you see there is about a $5 difference, which isn't huge, less than 10%, um, but you know, nothing to sneeze at and always something to strive for is as much um, gross profit or income as you can derive um, per unit managed. The next is enterprise expenses and interestingly um, those best um, actually had a higher cost, enterprise cost relative to the rest and then we get on to where the real difference was and it's really in the cost structure. Um, those best rangelands that should sit at about 25 um, after everything was said and done, and the rest rangeland sat at about forty dollars per DSE, so there was fifteen dollars difference um, in between those two um, cohorts. And then once you get out to the profit component, you can see that as a result of those big changes in costs and small changes in income, you get this massive difference a doubling at least of profit um, at, with the best relative to um, the rest. So, you know, the best rangelands producers generated some pretty impressive profits. Um, the rest generated this $15 um, per DSE. And I'm going to go now to explore what it was about those components that actually made a big difference. So the first one is the highest cost in your business. And what's the highest cost in your business? It's labour. And you may say, well, I don't charge myself out at, um, at a labour cost and that you're entitled to do that. Um, but what we do is we do charge you out. So regardless of whether you charge yourself out or not, or you take drawings or choose not to, which is you're entitled to, we'll charge every family labour unit. In this case, we charge the first family labour unit out at $70,000 per labour unit. And a labour unit's 240 days. And we know that you don't work 240 days, you work a lot more. Um, and um, so, whereas ev and every subsequent family labour unit is charged out at $60,000. But if you employ farm labour, we put the actual cost of the employed farm labour um, on there as well. So, so regardless um, of, of how you um, allocate your costs for labour, we provide you with a market competitive cost rate. And so what you've got here is if we just go down to this labour costs, um, inclusive of contractors, you've got the best doing $7.20 per DSE. And if you want to get um, per DSE back to goats managed, <laughs> effectively um, every DSE is is roughly a um, a goat managed or thereabouts. It's pretty close. Um, so and the rest had eighteen dollars twenty. So that was the key issue between um, the most profitable and the remainder. It was really the cost of labour, and then you've got with every labour unit, you also have additional costs, which are um, labour related costs. So you don't just have a labour unit, you've got you know, a ute, you've got a vehicle, you've got the depreciation, you've got the fuel, um, all those sorts of things are the labour related costs. So 
the total for um, the best producers was about $12.50 per DSE. And for the rest, it sat at whatever the sum of that is, which I think is about what's that, $26 per DSE. So a very big increase between in labour and labour-related costs. And so then when you go to labour efficiency, which isn't exactly the same thing, because you could have lots of low-cost labour units um, and poor efficiency. Labour efficiency is just a measure of the number of days worked relative to the number of goats managed. And in this case, we've got labour efficiency of um, around 10,000 DSEs per labour unit or 10,000 DSEs per 240 days worked relative to 6,600. So <laughs> these producers um, were doing it a bit more aggressively relative to these and that resulted in better income for every labour unit there. So when we go on to the next changes, they were relatively small and they were the best. Um, this is an interesting one for my mind, um, supplementary feed. So there was one or two out of those four producers that actually um, supplementary fed their uh, goats through the drought and that equated to $1.77 over the five year period, which might have been you know, $15 or something for the whole year, but um, over the five years, it averaged out at $1.77. Um, repairs and maintenance. And I look at that line and wonder whether part of the labour inefficiency is because there's so much R&M. And, and this is where, or repairs and maintenance, and this is where you got to start thinking about, well, is it time to invest in the capital works to stop me doing all that R&M so that I'm no longer chasing my tail? and invest in some capital works to take off the pressure of always having to chase my tail with the repairs and maintenance. I don't know, it's just food for thought. These guys spent more, or guys and girls spent more than these people over here. Um, depreciation um, sat at $4 per DSE versus $1.64. That's, um, you know, graders and dozers and, um, and vehicles and all that sort of stuff. Um, I'm not sure whether there's much to read into that, but all of those differences were relatively minor when you compare it with the real difference, was, which was labour. So it's all about labour efficiency. Anything you can bring into your business um, that actually improves labour efficiency, um, you should be considering it. And I guess that's, you know, operational stuff, which is, you know, how you muster goats and those sorts of things. But importantly, it might be also the way that you, you know, monitor waters, the way that you, um, uh, the way that you, you know, uh, invest in um, keeping fences up and all the things that you do um, from day to day, and then how much time you spend on other enterprises as well. Okay, so what were the other components that actually drove the differences between the best and the rest? Um, the first one was cost of production. And what I've got here is the best compared to the average. So this is telling me, and it's measured along this bottom axis in percentage change. So what this is telling me is that, so the average for every one of these indicators sits at zero and then what I've done is deviated from zero. So what this means is the cost of production of the best was $3.75 and that was roughly, you know, 30% below where the average sat. That's how to interpret this graph. The next one was price received. Um, the, the best received about $20 more, 20% uh, 20 higher price received relative to the average. Now, I'm not sure why necessarily. I suspect there might have been a fair few underweights potentially in that um, in the rest group, and there wasn't a lot of underweights in the best group. So I'll talk to that shortly. Um, production was around 15.5 um, kilos per head sold, um, and the average actually achieved better than that. Um, production per DSE was about um, $8, uh, 8.1 kilos um, carcass weight per DSE. Scale, um, 
you know, the best uh, managed, um, that says 17,000. I think it's actually closer to 10,000 um, DSEs. Um, oh no, that's the scale of their business, I apologise. So the total scale of the best was 17,000 or 18,000 DSEs. Um, would that improve their labour efficiency? Yes, quite potentially. Their labour efficiency is down here, sitting at about 10,000 DSEs. Um, and that was 300%, that scale was 300%, so three times higher. Um, so the others sat at around 5,000 DSEs managed. Um, we talked to gross profit per labour unit and then return on assets managed averaged over that five years was nine years, which is just 9%, uh, which is absolutely phenomenal. And incidentally, a lot of that came from two years where, um, you know, returns were sort of in that 20%. So when you win, you win big. Um, again, I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know as rangelands producers. And when it's bad, it can be really bad. And I know you've experienced that over the last few years. Okay. Um, Look, I won't go into this, there's probably not enough time. Really all I wanted to say with this was, there's two pathways to high profit. You can pursue high production, which is the first column, or you can go with a really low cost structure, which was the second column. And all that's showing is, there's no one way to get to the end game. Um, basically, there's always more than one way to get there. So. Um, so, you know, some people got there, two of those producers got there with a really low cost structure. They were really tight on their costs and two of the others really pushed it through um, some pretty good production measures. So what can you take out of that um, for your business? Well, I think the best way, I've tried to present it in goats sold. So the assumption, the background assumption here is that the number of goats sold represent roughly 50% of the goats that you run. So what's the target? Well, I think it's $130 per goat sold, which is about, and that's at $8.10 per kilo carcass weight. I think your target, you know, you've got to try and hang on, and I know that it's not always easy, um, but your target should be an average. Those guys um, in that best cohort did 15.5. In the rest, they did greater than, um, greater than that. So I think your target should be around that 16 kilos of carcass weight um, per head sold. Now, um, some of that, there was no differentiation between skin on and skin off. So um, I understand that that potentially is an issue with the interpretation of that. Um, uh, you've got to be looking at around that 10 to 12,000 goats managed per labour unit. Um, and then finally, uh, you've got to have your cost structure around $50 per goat sold in operating costs. And when we drag that through to per DSE, it's just half of those basically. $70 per DSE, greater than $70 in income, greater than 16 kilos per car carcass weight per head sold. Um, still that 10 to, 10 to 12,000 DSEs per labour unit and less than $30 per DSE in operating costs. Um, so where are the opportunities as I see them um, in, in goats? Well, I think the first point is um, you've got to start collecting better data. Um, start trying to know your livestock numbers better. I know in opportunistically managed herds, that's nearly impossible. But even if they went in the, in the yards, if you can somehow tally your your um, billies and your nannies and your wieners, you start to get a feel for um, for what your numbers are likely to be across the whole business. Um, and I'm hoping that in time, um, there'll be more technology that helps us with this. So you don't have to go near them, but they might you know, walk over a trapping system or something like that, that actually weighs them and gives you that information in real time. Um, because I know that there's a lot of impracticalities around um, the labour associated with uh, the cost of knowing your livestock numbers. Genetics and weight gain data. Um, look, a lot of, two of those producers in the best performers um, had infused meat breeds. So they were a sort of rangelands cross, if you like, F1 or F2, um, and two didn't. 
and um, so I'm not convinced it's the only way to get there but probably if you don't have it um, then you need to have a pretty low cost structure because your weight gains will be lower or at least that's what the anecdotes suggest um, so you know, I do think we need a lot more work in this genetic space because all I'm working on at the moment is a lot of anecdotal information and a lot of you already, I know, will have already invested in um, infusing meat breeds into your rangelands herds and will tell me that you, you know, got better weight gains per head but also um, better carcass um, yields. Um, but it would just be good to have records of that data because, you know, at the moment there's not a lot of data out there. So again, I wonder whether there's an efficient way that we can capture that that's not so labour intensive. And then finally, I think the investments into labour efficiency are absolutely um, critical. So anywhere that you can sensibly replace labour with infrastructure, um, you should be considering it. Um, but I'm also conscious that you don't want to be handling goats unnecessarily because anyone I speak to who tells me about behavioural characteristics of goats and movements and those sorts of things tells me well there's a cost to you know moving them into the yards and not getting them away or there's weight gain you know there's weight gain weight losses when um, logistical issues occur and I didn't get them on the truck and I had to put them in the cooler they just weren't happy so I'm aware of all those sorts of things. Um, so look, I think I'll, I'll, look, there's just one other graph I want to present. Um, and you may, for those of you who subscribe to um, the Thomas Elder Markets reports, you may have seen this today or it might be out tomorrow. But this is data from um, Matt Dalgleish, who works for Thomas, Thomas Elder Markets. And um, he just looked at um, some ways of, correlating the eastern um, lamb indicator with the over the hooks goat price. And so um, one of those correlations is really good, which may, which is the bottom one and the top one's not so good. But um, where, what he came up with is this forecast range, which is the blue dots for where he thinks the range in future goat meat prices might be on the basis of the relationships on the left-hand graphs here. And so he thought that, you know, you're going to sit somewhere around that um, $8, $7.50 to $8 or um, $7 to $8 or thereabouts um, over the next few years. I just thought it was one of the questions that I was provided um, was uh, about that forecast. And I'm not, an anal I'm not a price analyst and um, so... I just went to the price analyst and, and that this is what he came up with relatively um, quickly. So there might be a bit more um, meat to this, but watch that Thomas Elder Markets. The information out of there is free and they should come up with something in the next few days that um, is a bit meatier than what I've just presented there. Uh, I'm conscious of time, but I've got um, the final, the final opportunity is really the opportunity to build skills. Um, and so I know MLA are investing in a profitable grazing system goat course, and that a lot of the questions that you asked, which I'll go through now, um, were all about the practicalities of, of goat production. And I think those practicalities, um, a lot of those will be covered in that course. So look out for that course. I'm sure Peter Schuster um, has developed that course and I'm sure there'll be, um, it'll be pushed out your way shortly. So I think there's a lot of value in that. And then, um, so that's a supported learning program where um, you more or less got a coach to um, work you through some of the problems. And then finally, um, in a couple of months in February, we're coming out on uh, to deliver a business edge course out your way. Um, and so, you know, there's some real value in that. I know Tanisha's attended and there's some real value in that course. And I'd encourage you, it's just the start to building your financial literacy and sort of interpreting some of the things that we've gone through tonight. So I think I'll um, leave that there. But Tanisha, um, are you online there? Yes, thanks, John. Great. Um, so do you want me just to quickly um, go through those questions that um, people sent through or what's the best approach from here? Um, I think in the interest of time, perhaps just go through a couple. We don't have any okay. questions that have come through 
at this end at the moment. So I'll give everyone a ch chance to put their questions in the questions box. And while we're giving them a couple of minutes, you can just go through one or two questions. Okay, great. All right, um, so set stocking versus rotational grazing. Um, look, I didn't look at it, so I can't give you any data of that. Um, uh, and I didn't break down um, harvesting trap yard, that sort of stuff. I tried to, but I just, I, I couldn't get, make any sense out of the numbers there. Um, key production targets, hopefully I've went, th I've been through those. Um, benefits of improved genetics. Look, I, I spoke to someone <coughs> about improved genetics. Um, the One of the issues is, of course, that um, if you're looking to introduce meat um, breeds, the experience suggests that, you know, you've got to get rid of your males out of those. You need a clean muster to remove the rangelands billies or the um, meat breeds just won't have a hope. So, and if it's practical, get rid of the wieners as well, because they'll, the wiener billies start working early. I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, um, but, you know, if you want, now that good genetics is, is coming at such a cost, if you have to maximise your return. And so that means a bit of good management. And I know that may not be practical in a number of your businesses if they're not behind wire and hard to manage. So um, I appreciate that. Is worth joining uh, feral nannies with meat goats or more commercially viable just to use ferals. Well, um, you can be profitable with both, but if you're going to join them with those meat goats, um, you know, make sure you do it in a really managed way as I've just outlined. Uh, what's the projected market growth? I can't tell you over 20, I've given you three. Is feedlotting pop, pop, um, profitable? Um, I don't know. Uh, back to the audience if anyone's done it, um, but uh, there is there was a study just looking at um, weight gain, and um, in drought they put on more weight gain with supplementary feeding relative to outside of drought, but it wasn't profitable outside of drought. Someone asked a question about um, minimum weights or what's underweight. You know, I think it's I think it probably differs between processes, but it's around eight to ten kilos. What's the average length of time to grow out a goat to sale weight? That is seasonally dependent, but I spoke to a grower today and he he ran through the numbers. He said, Well, if you've got a good season, Billy's will get to 16 kilos carcass weight in a year. So that's 32, roughly at 50% with a skin on type market that's 32 kilos live weight, deduct your three kilos for birth weight, and that comes out at 79 grams a head. I then look for some data supporting that, and there is some. So, so in a reasonable year, that's a year to get those billies to 16 kilos carcass weight. Uh, Full-time joining versus planned breeding, um, so confined joining, not enough data. Um, to answer that one, I'm sorry. Uh, a few people were doing it in the group, but didn't really have a good enough data set to, to come up with a conclusion. Um, castration versus no castration. Again, anecdote, don't castrate them. Um, that in most cases of the people I spoke to, they restrict that restricted weight gain and added a whole lot of work. Um, so labor cost is a big one. And what are they doing differently? Is it genetics? Yes. Well, partly, two of them did. Is it feeding? Two of them did. Is it volume? Not necessarily, although they were, were big scale producers. Or is it bespoke markets? It's definitely not just bespoke markets. It's um, all those producers were commodity markets. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do it as bespoke, but um, none of these producers are. I think in your system, if you've got rangelands production, you accept your commodity producer and you drive your cost structure as low as possible. That would be my advice. Sorry, that's really quick and dirty. Any questions now? Thanks, John. Um, we've got time. There's one last question that's come through. So just while I change back to my screen, the question sure. is, is there any market for organic status goats? Ooh. Um, look, you, you're asking the wrong person, unfortunately. I'm sorry I can't answer that. I just don't, um, I, I don't know. Um, but I would imagine, you know, that the majority of what's going into, um, 
into you know at least western um, meats would be um, organic. So if there was, they'd be already pursuing it. I don't know is the answer. Sorry. That's great. Thanks, John. Um, sorry, we've just had one last quick question that's come through. They've asked, were the two producers who fed also the producers who improved their genetics? Uh, yes, that's very astute. Um, yes, they were. Yes. Um, yes, they were. So they had rangelands infused. Um, yes, but there is study showing even rangelands only did get um, superior weight gains in drought. Well, they got superior weight gains in drought and out of drought. It just wasn't profitable out of drought, as I recall it. But I'll send to Nisha the link to the study so that you guys can um, and girls can look at it yourselves. Um, but MLA did uh, funded a project that looked at it. And um, so, yes, that whoever has asked that question, astute question, and yes, they were, is the answer. Great, thank you very much, John. That's the end of the questions for this evening. Um, so I'll just thank everyone and thank you as a presenter for attending today's webinar. It's been very, very interesting. I know I've certainly learnt a lot about goat production in Western New South Wales. I'll just ask the audience if you could please take the time to complete the post webinar survey. It is a great way for you to provide feedback to us and all also to guide any future events, particularly if goats are a topic that you're interested in hearing more about, please let us know. If you have any questions, as John mentioned, please feel free to email me and I can pass them on or, or send you some relevant information. And you will also receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this webinar tomorrow night. So if you wish to go back and have a look at it again, that'll be in your inbox tomorrow night. Thank you, John. Thanks very much for having me, really appreciate it. Hope you guys are having a great season and um, yeah, all the best.